Hello and welcome to Skate's third art industry hangout. I'm Catherine Tully, I'm a freelance journalist, and today we're going to be talking about online art trading businesses. So on our panel we have Osman Khan, Managing Director of Cadillac, Sebastian Quillich, President and CEO of Artsy, and Chris Froome, the co-founder and chairman of Artspace. So first of all, thanks very much for participating today, guys. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, Thank, you. Thank you for having us, Catherine. Oh, good to speak to you, Sebastian. We're seeing an increasing number of old and new companies today um, offering people the chance to buy art online. So this is clearly a dynamic area, but given that traditional methods of buying art are still pretty entrenched and all um, revolve around the idea that people can experience art in person, there are clearly plenty of challenges as well. Um, so to January piece in The Economist, uh, few cultural mediums have defied the digital revolution quite like the art market. So, um, hopefully today's hangout will address some of those issues. Um, will online art businesses ever be able to compete equally with traditional models or even replace them in any meaningful way? How do you go about establishing and maintaining a, a successful e-commerce model for art? And also, what are the benefits of the art market of online trading, both now and in the future? So, um, my first question is, what are the, the key requirements of a successful online art trading business? And um, Osman, sorry to put you in the hot seat here, but what, what's your take on that from Padelet? Uh That's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, I would say that sort of first and foremost, though, you know, the, the beauty of the uh, offline model has always been the ability for someone to see art and actually, you know, physically interact with it in some capacity in the arts and so on and so forth. I think the biggest challenge that we all probably face on the virtual side is trying to replicate that experience in some shape or form. And I think with that in mind, sort of, I, we really do believe that the user experience and the user interface of displaying art is probably one of the biggest criteria as you think about selling art online. And I think in particular, it's, it's going beyond what has been the traditional view of static images online to really thinking about the technology and how you can utilize that to zoom in, scale, show art in different settings and capacities within your room or whatever the collector might be, to really give a collector sort of a comprehensive view of how that art can be actually examined, really akin to what a more in physical experience would look like. And I think you know technology has really taken us a long way in being able to do that. And all the people represented on the panel here today, you know, have taken different views on how to actually show art. But I think if you're able to capture that element of it, that's probably one of the biggest gating items to actually being able to sell art online. Chris, what's your thoughts on that at so ArtSpace? Well, I mean, from, from, from my perspective, when you consider uh, art as a category um, in an online context, and, and there have been, it is certainly in the early stages of internet transformation, and the same might have been said, or the same caveats might have been said about women's apparel and jewelry a decade ago when no one thought that those high-end products could be sold online. I, I think that by harnessing the power of the web, what we're trying to do at Artspace is combine, uh, as Osman has said, the um, visualization qualities of, of uh, the internet to present the work in different, different ways, to enable a video of artists and, and about the work to be presented, to present a lot more information to enable collectors to make an informed and confident buying decision. So I think that the characteristics that are requisite for success in the art trading business are not that dissimilar from those that are important in other trading businesses, which is to understand the needs of buyers and sellers and meet those needs most effectively. What about you, Sebastian? I mean, Artsy's been going for, been live for quite a few months now. Do you have your thoughts on what um, drives success change since your launch? The, well, I, I think Osman's comment about the user experience is critical. Uh, clearly, having a site that makes users come back day in and day out is the goal. Uh, the question is, how do you get there? And what combination of inventory, educational material, editorial content, user-generated content, what combination of those things presented in what way will create the type of experience that people will come back to over and over. Um, and I think the art market is starting to invest in that in a rigorous way, in a substantial way, 
in the same way that they've invested in that in the offline space for a long time. We have a rich tradition of investing in great architecture to create great experiences for museum goers or creating a great experience for an evening sale at an auction house or a great gallery. Um, and I think the art market is now starting to do the same thing in the online space. That's interesting. Um, my second question is sort of touched on some of the points you've raised there. Like, what advantage does online trading offer over traditional galleries and auction houses to both buyers and sellers of art? And Bastian, I was going to direct that one back to you because you used to work at Christie's, so you've sort of seen this from both angles. I mean, what's your thoughts about that? Well, I think not very dissimilar from any other industry. You know, typically you have incumbents who have advantages of scale, a built-in audience, and maybe startups that can move a little more quickly uh, don't have uh, a built-in model that they need to protect. On the other hand, the specific case of Artsy, we're very much a platform and we partner with, whether it be an auction house like Christie's or Sotheby's, uh, whether it's traditional galleries. Um, so it's really, you know, we can grow alongside the traditional businesses and hopefully help them reach a larger audience. Osman, what do you think? Would you agree no, I think that's a great point. I think the one other thing I would add is I think the online really also enables you to sort of create transaction efficiency. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think we have the ability on the, on the online to display a lot of information, to create e-commerce platforms where people can look at something, they can buy it, they can inquire about it, and do sort of this entire consummate transaction in one place. And I think that has a lot of meaningful benefits for all the stakeholders, if you will, in that value chain of, of displaying and selling art. It allows for greater liquidity and faster liquidity for the individual selling it. It allows for more transparent information for the buyer and their ability to consummate a transaction a lot faster. Um, and I just think that that entire process, because we're dealing with virtual spaces and less having to deal with overhead and, and high cost structures, you're able to do things a little bit faster and more seamless than you might be in the offline world. Um, and not to say that there's a lot of elements of the offline that you sort of want to eliminate, but I think there is this notion when you're thinking about the virtual space of being able to do things a little more fast because all three of the platforms that are represented here are very nimble in sort of their approach to that. I think that gives us sort of a competitive advantage over the offline model. Chris, do you think that's true that sort of speed and efficiency in a sense are two big advantages that you've got? Well, I, I think when one assesses those retail models, you, you do so on a variety of different vectors. One is price, one selection, convenience, service, information. I think online can compete effectively with offline counterparts uh, uh, across a number of those different parameters. I do think that partnering uh, is very important. Um, our objective at ArtSpace is to help raise the visibility of excellent programming, um, whether it be in the museum or gallery context, as well as with the artistic practice. And so, we are amplifying the visibility of, of those artwork constituents to help them be more successful and try to architect our business in a manner that helps give them greater visibility, greater transparency, which I think ultimately is going to expand the whole market. Okay. Okay, so moving on, like, I mean, how does online art trading financially compete with the strongest brick and mortar models out there today? Um, I know that you've all got slightly different models when it comes to that. Um, Chris, perhaps I can, and you could um, pick up as well to uh, talk a little about that as well. Sure. Well, I, I, you know, indisputably from a uh, fixed asset and a working capital intensity standpoint, the online model is superior in many ways. Um, ultimately, you know, those uh, capital characteristics are going to uh, dictate a margin structure of the business to produce an ROI that I think ultimately is going to be very high. Um, but again, I think that um, the very successful offline uh, partners, galleries, uh, in particular auction houses, have established relationships with large groups of, of constituents. They serve exceptionally well. I think the market can be expanded. That's where we can play a role. Um, and ultimately, I think these two channels will continue to grow side by side complementing each other and ultimately expanding the whole business. I mean, Osmond, I mean, Padlate is essentially a virtual 
uh, auction house competing against um, traditional bricks and mortar uh, auction houses. So, uh, what, what do you think about the? No, I mean, I think Chris's point is actually spot on. I, I think that's exactly the point is that not having to have sort of the more traditional overhead fixed costs uh, and that sort of, you know, asset allocation, if you will, to a physical infrastructure that's really large or the same number of personnel required to fulfill a transaction is really where we start to sort of uh, separate ourselves from the pack, if you will. And I think our view has always been that enables us to charge a more competitive commission structure and pass savings on to both the buyers and the sellers um, because we operate in this virtual infrastructure. Because you know, if you start from sort of the, the ground up, if you will, on a virtual platform, you think about all the different ways you can sort of eliminate costs on the overall platform. And I think having done that, you really are able to keep a much more competitive structure and that it does enable you to compete on a more financial level with the traditional auction houses. Faster, okay. would you agree with that? Yes, I think certainly to Chris's point, I mean, you're seeing the traditional bricks and mortar players going in more and more heavily into the online space. And so Christie's, for example, is having 30 online only sales this year. Um, so clearly they see the potential margin uh, benefits of being online. Uh, I think on the other hand, it's important not to overstate um, the kind of efficiency of the online market. I think one of the things that's working well with this kind of wave of online business is that they are really hybrid. I mean, we have you know someone in Asia, someone in Germany, someone in London, someone in LA, um, and it really is about uh, that kind of human connection both to acquire inventory to have as well as uh, to give a high touch experience for users. I mean, that was actually really going on to my next question, which is really, you know, what type of company has the best chance of uh, coming up on the e-commerce player? Is it those entrenched uh, companies in the business like Sotheby's or Christie's, or, or is it new entrants? I mean, I guess that's a rather leading question given the present company assembled here. But I mean, can both succeed, or, or are the traditional players sort of weighed down by all this infrastructure that you talk about? Osman, you've got to talk about that. No, I, I think they just they have different challenges. You know, I think all those traditional incumbents have been doing business very successfully for a number of years. And I think for them it's sort of embracing much to Sebastian's point, how is it that you sort of can manage a hybrid online, offline model? You know, we see it in the auction houses all the time, they're embracing the online, they're trying to find new ways of doing different things, becoming more innovative in their approach. I just think their biggest challenge is sort of being encumbered by a more traditional business model. So moving a little bit more quickly to an online model makes it harder for them because there is a much more established way of how they've been doing this for so long. Um, however, I, you know, that being said, these are all really large organizations. You know, to Chris's point, these galleries that established collective bases, auction houses have been around for hundreds of years. They have the, the sort of capital allocation as well as a collective base to really make moves in the industry if they were, they were able to. I think the challenge for them is how fast and how quick, um, and if so, can they sort of balance the existing models with the new models for the most part. What do you think, Chris, about that? Is that, is that fair? Well, I, 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 w I would agree with a lot of that. I would, I would add, though, that um, there aren't many examples um, in the online space where the incumbent in the bricks and mortar world have successfully made the transition to dominate the online virtual analog. So I do think that the internet is its own channel of distribution. It is distinct. It requires particular skills um, and autonomy of execution in order to be successful. And, and it, in the art market in particular, I believe it requires a combination of business and art world relationships and consumer internet digital media experience in order to be successful because that's really ultimately the, the ingredients that are going into build than successful relationships with both buyers and sellers. That's a great point. Yeah, what about you, Sebastian? Is that ring true? Well, I, I tend to agree with Chris. There, there is certainly, that there's traditionally been uh, difficulty for large incumbents to make transitions. That said, I think the internet has become so core to business that you have all the incumbents really kind of setting up uh, separate online businesses, hiring people who come out of those spaces. Um, 
So I really don't see that. You know, I I I envision that there will be uh, a healthy and competitive online space with both traditional players and uh, new entrants. Hmm. That's my next question, I guess. Um, is really looking at the limitations of online art trading. I mean, how do you overcome, for example, the desire for buyers to view art in person, which has been, you know, one of the driving forces of the market to date? I mean, Chris, do you want to kick off on that one? Sure. Um, you know, I think that um, there's always trade-offs in every business model, and, and I think that when you have partners all around the world, to the certain extent, you can facilitate, um, you know, the, the viewing of artwork in person. I think that for someone who is, you know, living in Kuala Lumpur and the artwork is in New York, uh, that's an acceptable trade-off to be able to see the work, visualize it, as Osman had said, in multiple ways, get information, see a video of the artist, talk to someone about it in depth. You know, those qualities are, um, in some instances, just as important as seeing it in person, although it does vary based upon the type of work being assessed. Some works translate much better online than others, and I think ultimately you'll see a variation in migration of online sales across medium and across price points. But ultimately, this is an $80 billion business with $3 trillion in assets with very little liquidity. And so I think that there's a massive multi, multi billion dollar opportunity for the online players. And again, they'll coexist with the effective bricks and mortar operators just as in every other category. Well, that's an interesting point about you sort of uh, harnessing uh, more liquidity in the market, which is desperately needed. I mean, Austin, what do you think? How do you get around the sort of the driver the, um, or the, the, the traditional element that involves buyers and artworks being in the same space <laughs> and able to interact? I think the way we sort of approach it is that there is a price point consideration um, at which you can sort of transact art online. And over time, you can move that price point up as you develop a more established collector base, as the collectors understand the validity of your brand, and you become an established marketplace. You know, and I think the reason we sort of believe that is if you look at all the traditional high-end luxury e-commerce platforms over, over the years, you know, Gilt or sort of Blue Nile for diamonds, whatever the case may be. All these platforms, when they first started, they started selling something, you know, a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand dollars, whatever the case may be. And over time, migrated to the ability to sell much more higher price point works as they had a more established brand, as they provided more information, as they sort of solved the intermediate point pain points. So I think for us, it's like, I really do believe the near term limitation, if you will, is what is that optimal price point which you can transact? And, you know, I think all of our collective sites show inventory that's five, six, even seven figures. But it's really, to facilitate a transaction online, I think today, given where collect collectors are comfortable, where things are happening in broader e-commerce, it's really about a price point limitation. And over time, I think we'll all move up that value chain. But in the near term, I think we really do believe that there is a sweet spot, if you will, where someone is willing to transact sight unseen because they know the artist, because they know the platform, because they trust the sort of buying modes, if you will. And that, for us, hasn't been that much of a challenge. However, if you're trying to sell something for a million dollars, I think the pain points become slightly different, and you do want, the collector will probably want to see it or want to do it, and then you have to deal with the other hurdles along that. I mean, Sebastian, I, I, would, just inter, I would just interject that that's precisely what we see online with our collectors. So they start out at um, a price point that's comfortable for them, and then the second, third, and fourth purchase quadruples over time. Exactly. We have seen, you know, the the price point rise for uh, repeat uh, repeat uh, collecting uh, experiences, and I think that that's awesome. I think that that's going to continue as people have a good experience. They understand that, you know, there there is someone. It's a real company, you know, with real works, and and I think that that's going to continue to push price points higher as we get to do, and as others do. Sebastian, I know that um, Artsy is partnering with the Armory Show and has got a preview online at the moment of, um, of what some, a selection of, of works um, to sell at the Armory. I mean, do you see that that's part of a way of overcoming this issue of like the desire to be up close and physical with the artworks that you're almost facilitating physical transactions as well as online transactions? Well, I think that's certainly a part of it, and I think 
the idea that at lower price points a platform will be more transactional and at higher price points it will be more informational, educational, certainly makes sense. I think it's worth pointing out, uh, as we all know, that the trend are in the right direction, right? The trend certainly favors the online space. When you see my two-year-old son swiping the TV screen, it's very clear he's going to be comfortable buying art online. Um, and so I think you also see, going back to Osman's points, uh, there is advantages of being online. We see the average distance on Artsy between buyer and seller is over 2,500 miles. And so when you have this increasingly fragmented art world, you know, it used to be that you could just go to, you know, Soho Gallery building on West Broadway 30 years ago and you'd have a pretty good sense of what was going on in the contemporary art world. Similarly, if you had a gallery, you could open up there and kind of reach a significant portion of collectors. That's far from the case anymore. The art market is increasingly fragmented, it's global, and that's very, very well suited for an online platform. Okay, well that brings me on to my last question then. That's, uh, we, and again, this is something we've kind of touched on already, but like, how does online art trading contribute to the development of the art market? Particularly, how does this model develop in the future? And um, Chris, I wanted to ask you about that, because I know that um, you know, art space is, is big at looking at um, the platform as a curatorial service as well as a sort of distribution platform. I mean, do you think that all of those things will develop in tandem, that all of those things will carry on being important, or can you see this model sort of one element really coming out in the future is the most sort of valuable um, part of the offering. Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, from, from our perspective, this is a category where it's been very difficult to view and, and learn about a wide selection of artworks at one time. And so we provide the ability for the collector to drill down very quickly, uh, as with many of the other folks here, um, uh, and find what they want. And, and ultimately access a wide range of galleries and cultural institutions and build relationships with them that can endure. So when a collector goes to a museum, they can then go on ArtSpace and buy that work that very day. They can go in and call the gallery. They can develop a relationship. And ultimately, in our interest, we ensure that our gallery partners are more successful. And so I think that ultimately, you know, there's 30 million people in America who buy art every year. Lots of the art that they're buying is um, you know, not the kind of art that you could tell a story about. So what we're trying to do is enable people to buy work that's great, that has a provenance, that has a story, and ultimately it becomes a point of conversation. And, and I think in that way, all of these players who are facilitating greater access are going to expand the market in a way. And more, more access has got to be good, um, most certainly. I mean, Sebastian, what do you think about that? I mean, what, what role do you see in space playing here? Now I'm in the future. Well, certainly this idea of access, I think, is critical. Giving people the ability to see a wide range of works uh, with the kind of ease and comfort uh, of being at home, and as importantly, without the intimidation uh, that's often been a part of the art world, I think is critical. I think there's a lot of people, you know, we're seeing a lot of people from the tech community who don't, haven't traditionally been a part of the gallery world, are not particularly interested uh, in kind of maybe some of the traditional ways that the gallery world has marketed before, but if they get comfortable and knowledgeable uh, from the comfort of online in their own home, then maybe are willing to establish those relationships. And I think that's going to play out more broadly across you know, a range of people around the world. Mm. Osman, what do you think? I think that last point that Sebastian made is probably the most important one. I really do believe all of us in this sort of online art space are cultivating you know, a, a new sort of digital community that's previously been unaccessed by the offline markets. And I think you know, we really do believe in this sort of notion of rising tide lifts all boats because our ability to cultivate that community is just good for the arts across the board because we've sort of tapped into a new collector base that's using our platforms to be the foray into the art market and hopefully that translates into a broader interest across the board. But I think previously, you know, much like Sebastian's point about the tech community, there's sort of all these untapped audiences that are now using the, the web and the virtual platforms to really think about art, examine it, acquire it, understand it. 
and we do hope that translates offline and online. But I think I think previously that was an unaccessed community, and I think that's the biggest sort of advantage that we all offer here today. So. Right. Well, I think that concludes the conversation. Um, thanks for joining us for Skate's Third Art Industry Hangout. A special thanks to our panelists for all your thoughts. I think that was really interesting, actually. And um, so thanks again, and we look out for future conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine.